G'day friends, welcome to Barney's Online for another week. It's a slightly different way of doing church, but nonetheless, God's people gathered around God's word. Uh, it's a great thing to do, to encourage one another and be encouraged to live for God. Now I hope that throughout the week you've been reaching out and staying in contact with God's people, and all the more so today. It's Sunday, grab the phone, sit at your computer, pick up your tablet, make sure you get in contact with somebody, and particularly if you're home alone. Now, if you're at home in a household with other people, why not spend some time today around the word, praying together, singing together, encouraging one another. Now, today, as we consider Revelation chapters 21 and 22, we're going to be reminded about what we ought to be longing for as God's people. There's lots of things you might be longing for right now. Perhaps you just want a hug. Maybe you're longing for that person who sits in front of you at church every week, who drives you up the wall. Maybe right now all you want is that person to be there. Well, we're going to see in Revelation 21 and 22, the gathering of God's people, the day when those longings well and truly will be met, gathered, past, present, future, all of God's people together, never to be separated again, and gathered, even more importantly, around God and around the Lamb, gathered to worship, to praise, to celebrate, to enjoy Him and His goodness forever. I'm going to pray to commit our time to God before we sing, and then we'll hear from some of our members again. Heavenly Father, we commend this time to you. Speak to us by your word. Change us to be like your son, the Lord Jesus, and set our hearts upon that day when he returns and we will be with you in glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, as we sing, I'd encourage you to sing along. Why not? If you have to stand up to remind yourself of how to do it, go for it. But uh, the words will come up on the screen. Join us as we sing. Blessed be your name in the land that is plentiful, where streams of abundance flow. Blessed be your name. Blessed be your name when I'm found in the desert place, but walk through the wilderness. Blessed be your name. Every blessing you pour out, I'll turn back to praise. When the darkness closes in, Lord, still I will say, Blessed be the name of the Lord, blessed be your name. Blessed be the name of the Lord, blessed be your glory. Blessed be the name of the Lord, blessed be your name, blessed be the name of the Lord, blessed be your glorious name, blessed be the name of the Lord, blessed be your name, blessed be the name.
I'm finding that uh, increased workload has been really challenging. I've been working about 12 hours a day, um, trying to provide good quality online lessons for all of my maths classes. And um, yeah, it's meant a lot of screen time as well. So I've been uh, getting lots of headaches and migraines and just trying to manage that as well as ex exhaustion on top of that. What I've been finding challenging is uh, not being able to uh, be in front of my students face to face. Uh, not being able to teach them practical work in a workshop rather than being stuck in an office teaching them all theory work and I'm missing uh, being able to meet with my house tutor every day and to build a relationship with them and to share the message of God's love with them. Well, I'm sure within the first week or two of this virus thing, you know, everything was a bit chaotic and all that, but pretty much Quite frankly, it's been really good for me. I uh, I don't have the uh, the doing my head in of the outside world. I'm just in here. I'm I'm able to be still in contact with everyone I love, and and personally, I think it's a benefit, <laughs> a blessing, a blessing out of a very very bad situation. For me. It is getting used to having everybody at home all of the time and um, I'm an only child so that can be a bit stressful um, and online learning for Tamara and Cassandra. Uh, and for me I found it challenging needing to go and line up at the shops bright and early in the morning just to buy toilet paper. It's something I never thought I would experience but it's really uh, helped remind me of how blessed we are in Australia that we don't normally have to line up for everyday essentials. The most challenging thing we are facing at the moment is homeschooling our little boy. Um, it's pretty hard and it's a very new thing for us as well as we are both working from home. So at the same time we are figuring out our work and the new routine trying to entertain Justin with the new routine as well. It's pretty hard. We are finding it really, really hard. Sometimes we lose of, uh, I mean, control of um, anger and all these things happening at the same time. So we know it's no good, but we are trying hard and it, it is a really challenging time for us. What's something you girls are finding hard at the moment? Home school. Because, um, because uh, um, it takes a lot of Practice, practice to get there. Yeah. And this week on my life changed quite dramatically um, as I, I self-isolate and work and live from this room. I will be supporting my sister in a couple of weeks time um, after she has a significant operation after um, having therapy for breast cancer. She'll need me to support her and look after her after this operation and therefore I need to be corona free and also healthy. Not only am I living from this room, but I'm also working from this room, which is quite a challenge. I look after an aged care service that provides services for clients in their home. At the moment, I'm really thankful for how everybody's working together to allow us to do things like church online and that sort of thing, and all the technologies that allow us to stay connected uh, virtually, even though we can't physically be with one another. I am thankful for also technology um, to help with the online learning because I am definitely not a teacher and um, I'm very thankful that I don't have to come up with everything myself. Uh, so very, very thankful for technology. And also um, I find a lot of comfort in music. Uh, so really enjoy being able to listen to music online, um, especially Christian music. Um, to remind me of how great and how big God is and how lucky we are. Um, our family time, I would say, because as a family, we don't get to have that much time to spend together because we both work full time. So this, um, this lockdown period, actually, it's giving us more time as a family and we are having really, really good time playing with Justin, doing some activities we never get to uh, the time to actually do so. So yeah, this time is just, I would say that it's a very good time for our family. I've been really thankful for just extra time at home with my beautiful girl, Jeffles, and all of the cuddles she's been giving me. It's very therapeutic. Um, but 
also as well just for the um, messages of kind of support and just checking in to see if we have things that we need from my family and from some friends as well um, and that's been really encouraging just to know that they're there if I need them. Uh, what I'm very thankful for is despite us being socially isolated in the ways that we are with our churches essentially being told we can't meet together in a, in a face to face manner that we still can meet over Zoom, over Teams, Skype, whatever and be able to continue to grow as uh, Christians together. This week we had Bible study for the first time over Zoom and it was really, really encouraging to be able to study the Bible together, to be able to pray for each other, even though we were all 20, 30 kilometers away from each other. So I'm very, very thankful for that. I'm thankful for Jesus because he rose in and out and I put a little book in it and I like my little box and, and I thank, I really thank you for the Bible. Amen. Um, I'm thankful for that we have a God and he's under control of this and that we'll be safe. I thank my family for supporting me and um, be willing to um, do without me for some time. And I'm grateful that um, they're here and they can support me through this time. I'm just going to cross over to my daughter standing at the door, keeping her social distance. Hi, Samantha. Hi. I'd like to encourage everybody at this time to make sure that they keep in touch, either by a quick phone call or um, a video conference if they've got the uh, ability. It makes all the difference and it um, keeps us connected. I'm thankful for the technology being user-friendly to me um, so that I can keep in contact with... Um, my nearest and dearest and my church family. Um, I'm thankful that I can invite Joe into my house every day in my lounge room and he just eases my anxiety um, with his calming way. Um, and I am thankful for the small opportunities I'm having to talk to non-Christian friends about the gospel because they keep telling me they're getting their calmness from me because they, I make them feel really calm. So all in all, I'm still to see a downside of this virus for me. I think the only thing that will probably challenge me will be when it's all over, trying to get me out of the house. As we come to hear from God's word, let me pray. Thank you, Father, that all scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting and training in righteousness. Open our hearts to receive your word that we may know you better and be thoroughly equipped for every good work through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Genesis chapter 11 Now the whole world had one language and a common speech. As men moved eastward, they found a plain in Shinar and settled there. They said to each other, Come, let's make bricks and bake them thoroughly. They used brick instead of stone and tar for mortar. Then they said, Come, let us build ourselves a city with a tower that reaches to the heavens so that we may make a name for ourselves and not be scattered over the face of the whole earth. But the Lord came down to see the city and the tower that the men were building. The Lord said, If as one people, speaking the same language, they have begun to do this, then nothing they plan to do will be impossible for them. Come, let us go down and confuse their language, so they will not understand each other. So the Lord scattered them from there all over the earth, and they stopped building the city. That is why it was called Babel, because there the Lord confused the language of the whole world. From there the Lord scattered them over the face of the whole earth. Revelation chapter 21 Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, 
the new Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Now the dwelling of God is with men. He will live with them. They will be his people. And God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain. For the old order of things has passed away. He who was seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. Then he said, Write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. He said to me, It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To him who is thirsty I will give to drink without cost from the spring of the water of life. He who overcomes will inherit all this, and I will be his God, and he will be my son. But the cowardly, the unbelieving, the vile, the murderers, the sexually immoral, those who practice magic arts, the idolaters, and all liars, their place will be in the fiery lake of burning sulphur. This is the second death. One of the seven angels, who had the seven bowls full of the seven last plagues, came and said to me, Come, I will show you the bride, the wife of the Lamb. And he carried me away in the spirit to a mountain great and high, and showed me the holy city Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God. It shone with the glory of God, and its brilliance was like that of a very precious jewel, like a jasper, clear as crystal. It had a great high wall with twelve gates, and with twelve angels at the gates. On the gates were written the names of the twelve tribes of Israel. There were three gates on the east, three on the north, three on the south, and three on the west. The wall of the city had twelve foundations, and on them were the names of the twelve apostles of the Lamb. The angel who talked with me had a measuring rod of gold to measure the city, its gates, and its walls. The city was laid out like a square as long as it was wide. He measured the city with the rod and found it to be 12,000 stadia in length and as wide and high as it is long. He measured its wall and it was 144 cubits thick by man's measurement which the angel was using. The wall was made of jasper, the city of pure gold as pure as glass. The foundations of the city wall were decorated with every kind of precious stone. The first foundation was jasper, the second sapphire, the third chalcedony, the fourth emerald, the fifth sardonyx, the sixth carnelian, the seventh chrysolite, the eighth beryl, the ninth topaz, the tenth chrysoprase, the eleventh jacinth, and the twelfth amethyst. The twelve gates were twelve pearls, each gate made of a single pearl. The great street of the city was of pure gold like transparent glass. I did not see a temple in the city, because the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. The city does not need the sun or the moon to shine on it, for the glory of God gives it light, and the Lamb is its lamp. The nations will walk by its light, and the kings of the earth will bring their splendour into it. On no day will its gates ever be shut, for there will be no night there. The glory and honour of the nations will be brought into it. Nothing impure will ever enter it, nor will anyone who does what is shameful or deceitful, but only those whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life. Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life, as clear as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb, down the middle of the great street of the city. On each side of the river stood the tree of life, bearing twelve crops of fruit, yielding its fruit every month. 
and the leaves of the tree are for the healing of the nations. No longer will there be any curse. The throne of God and of the Lamb will be in the city, and his servants will serve him. They will see his face, and his name will be on their foreheads. There will be no more night. They will not need the light of a lamp or the light of the sun, for the Lord God will give them light, and they will reign for ever and ever. The angel said to me, These words are trustworthy and true. The Lord, the God of the spirits of the prophets, sent his angel to show his servants the things that must soon take place. Behold, I am coming soon. Blessed is he who keeps the word of the prophecy in this book. Good morning. It's great to see you here this morning. It's great to be gathered to you, even in this way, to hear God's word. For those who don't know me, my name is Adam Richards, and I'll be finishing off this series in Revelation uh, that we've been looking at for the last month and a bit. So let us pray, and then we'll begin. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for your word, and we thank you for this opportunity to gather around your word this morning. We pray as your people that as we hear your word spoken, that by your power, through your efforts, you'll conform our hearts and our minds to know Jesus Christ. Help us to long for his coming kingdom, that we might be with him forever and ever. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. There have been several points in my life where I've been caught up or been caught upon the unexpectedly beautiful. What I mean by this is that as I've been going on in life, I've seen these points in my life where something unexpectedly beautiful has captured my heart and my soul for that time. And there are several parts, and I'm going to go through a few of those, that are really, wow, that was an amazing moment, and I wish I could go back there. The first one was the day of my wedding. My wife was unexpectedly beautiful. I say that now because even as I speak and we'll be watching this together, she'll be looking at me and saying, well done. And so I have fulfilled all righteousness. All jokes aside, and it was a beautiful day with my wife, it wasn't unexpectedly, and she was unexpectedly beautiful. The second one was when I went and saw the Grand Canyon. The Grand Canyon was an amazing sight. The canyon with the vistas of the water below, the great Colorado River and the blue sky holding above. It really captured my attention the day I saw it. It was unexpectedly beautiful. It was a vision that was seared into my mind that I would like to go back and see the Grand Canyon one day. It was just that beautiful. And we were there for such a period of time that we got to see the sunset happen. It was so magnificent. It was unexpectedly beautiful. Another was when I was in Italy. I saw the Statue of David done by Leonardo da Vinci and the Sistine Chapel. When I saw those pieces of art, they struck me to my core. I was unprepared for the skill, the grace, and just the sheer beauty of those pieces of art. I stood there and looked at the Statue of David for half an hour. It was captivating. I couldn't believe the skill involved in shaping this statue. And then when I saw the Sistine Chapel in Rome and I looked up and I saw the artwork and I saw what Michelangelo had done, I was amazed. It was beautiful. I just stood in that room and I was in awe of the beauty. I could have stood there for hours. It was unexpectedly beautiful and I longed to stay there even longer. The fourth time, and this was an unexpected shock to me at the time, was the birth of my first son, Ben. When Ben was born, I was completely unprepared for how beautiful a moment it was. As I held my son in my arms for the very first time, I cried. It was an 
unexpectedly beautiful moment. I remember going out and saying to my parents and saying, I have a son, his name is Ben, because we'd kept the name hidden at that time. And I was just tears in my eye and it was a moment of beauty. It was a moment of joy. As I reflect back on all those various moments in my life and think about how good they were, I think, wow, I'd like to capture those moments forever in my heart. I'd like to go and experience those things again. I can't go back and see my child being born, but I can go back and see those vistas. But the important thing as we look at this passage is that we will see something that is more beautiful, that is more unexpected. As we look at Revelation 21 and 22, we see God's great vision for humanity. We see the beauty, the sheer magnificence, the opulence of what he is doing. And he calls on our heart to long for him. See, as we've been looking at Revelation and seeing what God has been doing, as we look at the world and we see all the judgments poured out upon the world through these passage, passages we've been looking at, what God has been calling on us to do is to long for him, long for his creation, long for what he is doing. Joe started off this series and he started off by dealing with the seven churches. And we saw the seven churches and they were warned, make sure that you hold firm. Make sure you get rid of the corruption in the world. And then we move through the judgments of God encapsulated in the seven seals, then the seven trumpets, and then the seven bowls. And each of those was reminding us that God is cleansing the world, that God is judging the world for its sinfulness and rebellion against him. And as we looked at those, they hoped and the goal was that we would look beyond those, look beyond to see what God is doing, look beyond for the new creation. And then Dave finished off looking at the book and we saw those three great promises, those three great reminders that Jesus wins, that Satan loses, and with the loss of Satan, the corruption will be washed away and that now the books are open. Given that's what God is doing, we turn to Revelation 21 and 22 and we see the new creation come about. We see the new heavens and the new earth being made. And it starts in Revelation 21. And I'm just going to read from verse 22. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God prepared like a bride adorned for her husband. Weddings are a great analogy. They're an analogy of God's relationship with his people. They tell of how God will join with his people of that great, on the great day. I love doing weddings. I really enjoy marrying couples. It's one of the great privileges of the job that I do. The most exciting part and the part I enjoy most is that moment just before the bride walks in. Because what will generally happen is either the back doors will open or from the back of the church, the bride will come in. And at that moment, every eye turns to the bride. Every eye looks at her. And you see the bride, she's smiling, she's beautiful, she's adorned. And then she starts to walk up the aisle. And as you watch her, her eyes are focused. They're laser focused upon her groom. Everyone's smiling. It is a beautiful picture. That's the picture that God has here in Revelation. It is of a wedding of a beautiful bride, the church adorned 
dawned in white, which symbolizes her purity and her victory, and her eyes are on her groom, are on Jesus. That is the day we need to be looking forward to. The day where God is joined with his people forever. It is an exciting day for Christians. This is what weddings are about. They're about all of people looking around and being excited about this bride and this groom. Weddings are about a society. Weddings are about all the hosts looking on and being excited that this wedding day has finally come. And that's the day where the church is united with its groom, with Jesus, is the day we should be longing for. It's the day we should be excited about. And as all the heavenly hosts look on and see this wedding, it all happens for the glory of God. And this day is pictured as well with a second analogy where it is the new Jerusalem, the new city, the new creation that is coming down. We are pictured, the bride is pictured as a city. This is the three, or we're going to look at the three things about this bride which tell us how exciting is this day. And the first one is, as we look at the New Jerusalem, is that it is a city and it's not a garden. As we look at the new creation and the picture we have of the new creation before us, what we see is it's alluding back to Genesis and it's alluding back to what happened in Genesis chapters 1 through 3. In Genesis 1 through 3, God created man and he created man in his own image, in his own likeness. But man rebelled. He rejected a God and he rejected the place of God, which was the garden. God had given man this beautiful garden to care for, to extend, to build, to live in and to be in God's presence forever. But man rebelled against God and rejected him. And then he left the garden. He was thrown out of the garden. And the first thing he built when he left the garden, or one of the first things he built, was a city. And we read in Genesis 11 that man builds a city so as to make a name for himself. Having rejected God's name for him, He's decided to make a name for himself. So, man, rebellion against God, makes a city and rejects the garden. Why is this important? Because God doesn't just turn aside man's plans and man's ideas. Instead, he incorporates them into his own. He builds a city. And this city is far better, far greater far more opulent, far more powerful, far more secure than any city that man will, will build or can build. The city is enormous. The city is, and it's pictured here, is 2,000 square metres by 2,000 metres. It is an enormous city. Hopefully Dave will be able to put up on the screen and it should be hearing now. I took an image and showed you the size of this city when compared to the map of Australia. It is enormous and it's just one city. And the point is that this city cannot be built by man. This city is beyond man's architecture, beyond man's design. This city is opulent. It dwarfs the city built by man in Babel. See, man built a tower in his city, barely reaches the heavens. He thought his city built in Babel would make him secure, would make him powerful, would make a name for himself. But it's a tiny city. It's made of dirt, fired with clay. It's showing his technical ability, 
which is not that much. As you look at the cities of the world, and especially cities at this time, cities aren't grand, cities aren't great. We always think, oh, cities are the place of technology and the place of culture. But as we go through this COVID-19, what are cities now about? Cities are places of disease. They're dens of corruption, dens of wickedness, dens of deceit, dens of death. Throughout the ages, every time there's a plague, even now in New York City, what have the rich and the wealthy done? They've got in their helicopters and flown to Florida. What did they do when there were plagues in the old days? They got in their stagecoaches and drove out to the country. Man's cities are not that grand. Man's cities don't provide security. Man's cities, when the pressure is on, are full of wickedness and deceit. But not so this city. God's city is powerful. God's city is opulent. If you have a look at the description, I don't have time to go through all the descriptions. You see the wealth, its security. This is a city that will last forever and nothing will prevail against it. The second aspect of this city, God's city has no temple. And the reason it has no temple is because God will now dwell with his people. The city itself is the temple. The city itself is God's dwelling. You'll look in the description. You'll see in the description, it's not just length and breadth. It's also height. It's 2,000 kilometres long by 2,000 kilometres wide by 2,000 kilometres high. It's a cube. Which you go, a city that's a cube? What's the point? This is an allusion back to the temple. Why? Because the temple was a cube shape. What Revelation is trying to show us is the city itself has become the dwelling place of God. The city itself contains the glory of God. God's people gather together in this city to be with their God. People always talk about heaven and I've heard this so many times. When I'm in heaven, I'll get to do this or they picture heaven as the greatest dwelling or the greatest place to live. But I always say to people, I don't care about heaven. What I care about is that I am with God. That is the exciting thing for Christians. It is that we will live and dwell with our God, our Creator, forever and ever. That is the good news of the passage. That is what the passage wants us to long for. Not the opulence and the wealth of the city. They're bonuses. They're good things, no doubt. But the true joy, the true, great, awesome thing that God is working towards is to unite himself and his people forever. What I love about church, what I miss about church at the moment, is that I'm preaching to a camera. Dave's down on the right looking at his screen, taking a beautiful picture of me at this moment. And that is it. Where are the people? Where are the relationships? It is good that we gather together this way. It is good that we hear the word of God. But I long to see you. I long to be with you. I long to share fellowship and relationship with my brothers and sisters in Christ. If that is how I feel about you, and I do feel that, how much more 
do I want to relate rightly and be in the presence and dwelling of our Creator? That's where my heart is. That's what I truly long for. The third aspect of this city, the people now have access to the tree of life. I'm going to read from the scriptures, Revelation 22, 1 to 2. Then he showed me the river of the water of life, clear as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb down the middle of the city's main street. The tree of life was on each side of the river, bearing 12 kinds of fruit, producing its fruit every month. Here is a clear allusion back to Genesis. Here we see the tree of life from which man was barred from the beginning because of his rebellion. He now has full access. And notice, notice it's not just one tree. There's this tree of life. It's everywhere. And down the main street, down the main thoroughfare, is this river, this water of life. The description of the city that we're given, the description here is a city full of life. It's exciting to think that the death that is and the decay that is so much a part of our world will be wiped away, that it'll be gone, that this endless abundant life will flow out from the throne of God which I take to be the spirit in this case. And this, the trees which we were barred from, which Adam was totally separated from, we now have open access to. It is life in abundance. See, man in his rebellion, when he left and was thrown out of the garden, moved to the east, he was chasing after the light of the sun. He was removed from the garden and had to work the dirt, the soil, to produce a meagre existence. And he was outside the presence of God. In the new creation, in the creation that God is working to bring, we have life in abundance. We have a city that is beautiful, powerful, opulent. But most importantly, we are with our God and our Creator. We live in His presence. We will dwell with Him forever and ever. That is where our hearts need to be. That is what we need to be longing for. See, so as we go through this COVID-19 crisis, my question for you today is, what are you longing for? What are you hoping for? Yes, we're all hoping this will end. I know I do. I know my wife does. I know my kids do. But even at this time, is our hope and longing for the new creation? In some ways, it's easier to long for the new creation. Some days, it's harder because I think, God, why are you doing this to us? But then I turn to Revelation and I say, oh, this reminds me. The world is wicked. The world is corrupt. The world is full of decay. The world is full of death. This creation, this new city, that God is building, where God is the architect. That is what I long for. That is what we need to hope for. Which leads to the epilogue of this book, which leads to the end of this series. The epilogue of Revelation really deals with what are the main issues? How should we respond to what God has been saying to us throughout this series. And there are two aspects that John points out 
that really force Christians to realise what this book is about. The first is worship God only. He says, I, John, the one who heard and saw these things, when I heard and saw them, I fell down to worship at the feet of the angel who had shown them to me. But he said to me, don't do that. I am a fellow servant of you, your brothers, the prophets, and those who keep the words of this book, worship God. Worship God. That is the first point. That has been the point throughout Revelation. The reason the world is in the mess that it is, the reason the world is in the decay, is in under the bondage that it is under, is it has chosen not to worship God. It has chosen to reject God, to rebel against him. But as Christians, we know that we have been called for worship. We know we have been called to live to the praise and glory of our creator. In fact, as you look through Revelation 21 and 22, you see all the nations will now bring their glory towards God. That is why we exist, for the worship of God. I've heard it said about church. We do not go to church to worship, though we do worship at church. And the point is simply at this. Do we worship God at church? Well, of course we worship God when we gather together. But do we worship God when we leave the church? Yes. Do we worship God when we drive our cars? Yes. Do we worship God down at the supermarket when we're standing in the checkout? Yes. Do we worship God as we listen to the government give us decrees about what we should do? Yes. Worship is obeying our Creator and living and serving him and him only. We want to show the glory and the majesty of Jesus Christ our Lord and Saviour. We want people to understand the great forgiveness that God has given us in our Lord and Saviour. As I was doing my morning Bible reading this morning, I was reading in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. And it said this, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away, and see, the new has come. As God's people, we are new people. We are part of the new creation, meant for the worship of our Creator. Is that what we hope to do? Is that what we long to do? Live for his praise? Live for his glory? As we're cooped up in our houses, many of us be thinking, oh, I just long to go outside. I long to catch up with people. They're good things, no doubt. But do you have the same longing to worship God? Do you have the same hope to see God praised and glorified? How would you know? Well, we see that in the second part. And it is this. Those who long for God have a simple phrase upon their lips. And it is simply this. Come, Lord Jesus, come. Jesus is coming soon. He has promised that. He has promised that he will return. He has promised that when he returns, he will make everything new. This whole series in Revelation has been dealing with a word that we haven't used, and we haven't used it because it's an academic word. And the word is called eschatology. And what eschatology talks about are the end times, the ending things. But in reality, what Revelation is dealing about, what it is 
really asking us and questioning us about us all is this. What do you long for? Where is your hope? The words, come Lord Jesus, come, are a longing of the heart. They're a longing to be out of this world. They're a longing to say, no, this world is not enough. The only thing that can truly satisfy, the only thing that can truly bring us joy and happiness is our Creator, is our God. As we've looked at the series, as we've thought about all the different images, and there'll be questions and there's been issues. What is this image? What are we talking about? A dragon? What's this scarlet woman and this harlot? All those images should point us to this one simple idea. Are we longing for God? As we come to the end of the series and as we think about what we've heard, what has been spoken about, my one question to you is simply this. Are you longing for an end of this world and the bringing in of the new one to come? Are you longing for Jesus? If that is what you are doing, then you will say the same words. Come, Lord Jesus, come. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, we do thank you for your word and we thank you for this reminder that we need to be people who are longing for Jesus. We pray, Father, especially at this time as we deal with the COVID-19 crisis, that we will long for Christ. May we be people who are patient, gentle, loving, gracious as we glorify God and as we sing, come Lord Jesus, come. We ask this in his name. Amen.
We've got some announcements to share. Next week's Easter. And so Good Friday, Easter Sunday, we'll be having our services. Wherever you're watching this one currently, you'll be able to watch our Easter services. For Good Friday, we're going to try something a little bit unusual and we're going to try and do communion together. And so you may want to come as you watch the service uh, with some bread and some juice or wine uh, in order to have communion together with the rest of us as we do it all uh, at the same time. Uh, I think that'll be super encouraging, even if it's a little unusual. Again, if you want information or to find any of our stuff, it's all published on bar www.barneysingleburn.com slash livestream. There you'll find links to the services we've already had, to the pr great prayer meeting we had for our community a couple of weeks ago. And every day we're putting up Barney's daily devotionals and there's also some ways to get further information. But all of it is on barneysingleburn.com slash livestream. We're going to spend some time praying to our great God, our Saviour, the one who loves us and has given us everything. What is Adam's sermon on? into the elbow. <laughs> We're going to spend some time praying to our great God and Father, the one we long for and we, we want to give our lives to. He's the one who's in control. He's the one we need to bring all our concerns to. And so let's spend some time in prayer together. Father, we thank you for the challenging words we've heard today about where we put our hope. Father, help us to put our hope fairly and squarely in you and in your kingdom that is coming, in the things of God and the gospel. We pray that we wouldn't get blinded and distracted by the things of this world. Father, please help us to repent of where we've gone astray, of our idols, the things that we've longed for that are in defiance against you. Please forgive us for our failures and help us to love you and to yearn for you. Help us to put first your kingdom and your righteousness. Father, we pray for our community in this time of distress. Father, we thank you for our government and we pray that as they manage this whole crisis that you would help them to make wise and godly decisions. We pray that both parties would work together to come up with solutions and answers and propositions that really will aid everyone. Father, we pray for those who are struggling in the, and uh, who are now out of work as a result of this. We pray, please, that you might care for them. You might help them to bring their concerns to you. And we pray that they'll receive support from friends, from family, from the community, from Christians that they know. Father, help us to love our neighbour as you have loved us. Help us to shine like stars. Help us to be holding out the word of hope that you have given us. We pray that you'll give us easy and good answers when we have questions about you and about our faith in you. And we pray that through this crisis, many in our community might be caused to look to the Lord Jesus Christ, receive the hope and forgiveness that he offers. Father, we pray for our emergency services and we thank you for them. We pray for those hospitals that are struggling now and under the, under the pump. We pray for the staff there, please. Uh, help them to do their jobs well and carefully. We pray that lives will not be lost through negligence and tiredness or through lack of resources. Father, we pray that the measures that have been put in place will be effective at slowing down the infection rate. And we pray, please, that a vaccine will be found soon, that everything will be done to curb this disaster. Father, we pray for those countries that are much more badly affected than we are. Father, have mercy on them. We pray in those countries where it is illegal to be a Christian or the gospel has been suppressed or banned. Father, we pray that this might be the great opportunity and awakening with the media and the connections and the internet. We pray that many might come to Jesus. Father, we pray that you would bless your word and your gospel as it goes out. And we do pray for good care. We pray there for international 
agreement and uh, cooperation between different nations that uh, we might stem this thing. We pray that you would do your work. Father, we pray for those who are struggling in other circumstances, for those who are struggling because of the isolation and feeling desperately lonely. We, feel, we pray for those like Kevin Lowcock and Olaf uh, Brockenhaus-Shuck who are in hospital and trapped and feeling uh, very isolated with their broken hips and their surgeries. Father, please watch over them. We pray for uh, Carol after her uh, lung cancer surgery and thank you that she has come through that. And we pray for her. We pray for Sue Waddell with her uh, cancer as well. Please sustain her, help her to keep giving thanks to you each day and looking to you for strength. Thank you for friends and support. We pray for those with mental health issues or are struggling in other ways. Father, help us to be a great community that cares for one another. We pray that we might meet each other's physical, emotional and spiritual needs. Father, bless us and be with us and help us to know the great blessing uh, that it is more blessed to give than to receive. Help us to love like you have loved us. And Father, we pray for our church. We pray that we would uh, encourage one another in these times. We thank you for our small group network, which is flourishing. And we pray with the technological challenges that we'll be able to meet them. And we pray that this crisis might be over soon and that we might be able to come and meet face to face, which is so much better. We long for that day when we can rejoice together in your name, both in this building and in eternity. Help us to look forward to that day and we pray that you would come, Lord Jesus, come. Amen. I hear the Saviour say, Thy strength indeed is small, child of weakness, watch and pray, find in me thy all in all. Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe, sin hath left a crimson stain, he
Well, what an encouraging time together around God's word. I hope that from Revelation 21 and 22, you've had your heart set on that day that is to come when the Lord Jesus returns and we are with our heavenly father. That you join Adam in that prayer. Come, Lord Jesus, come. Now tonight, I hope you'll tune back in again at 7 o'clock. You'll find it on YouTube, on our YouTube channel, uh, as we go live for the cutting room floor. Uh, And Adam has a whole lot of material coming out of Revelation 21 and 22 that he felt he had to leave behind. And uh, he wants to share that with you. Of course, it'll be Q&A. If you want to join and ask your questions, make your comments along the way, you'll be very welcome to do that. Let me conclude with this prayer. Gracious God, you made an eternal covenant with us through the blood of your son and brought him back from the dead as the great shepherd of your sheep. Equip us with everything good for doing your will. Work in us what is pleasing to you through Jesus Christ our Lord, to whom be glory for ever and ever. Amen. God bless.